First, let you know that uh, Brother Nibley left at five o'clock this morning. I don't know if he, apparently he didn't tell many of you what was going on, but uh, that's okay. Uh, but he's on a plane right now somewhere over Chicago on his way to Egypt, where he will be uh, present at the opening of uh, some tombs that have never been opened before and the unwrapping of some early Christian uh, burials and uh, working with uh, Brother Griggs here on campus. I'll be taking his position, uh, not filling his shoes in any way, but uh, uh, directing our discussion for the next couple weeks while he's gone. We'll have five sessions together before he's back. Uh, I'm uh, John Welch. I'm the uh, president, past president of the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies, the general editor of the uh, collected works of Hugh Nibley and uh, professor over in the law school and one of the directors in the Religious Studies Center. So there you go. Uh, I'd like to begin with an opening prayer. Let me make just a couple general comments about what we hope to accomplish in the next five lectures. First of all, if I were in your position, uh, I would view myself somewhat as trying to catch up to a freight train that has been moving about 90 miles an hour for about 40 years. Uh, Brother Nibley has been working in the Book of Mormon area that long. He's covered an awful lot of territory. And uh, I remember when I first had a class from him as a, a freshman here at BYU. Um, he was, uh, in fact, the first lecture I attended. And uh, I'd had a lot of, uh, of ancient history and four years of Latin and things like that in high school, so I was prepared enough to at least understand and appreciate the incredible things he was talking about. But it still, even that long ago, was a mammoth chore of trying to catch up with where he already was. It's staggering to me to imagine your position as a student trying to pick up everything that's happened in the interim. Uh, so. Uh, I would suggest, especially for this particular class and for the final that I know you're going to have to take, that uh, you look at things like the approaching Zion volume that has recently come out, uh, volume six, seven, and eight of the collected works of Hugh Nibley, especially chapters 27 to 30 in volume six. That's uh, his, his concluding chapters in the approach to the Book of Mormon volume where he talks about the ways of the intellectuals, the, uh, the ways of the wicked, the nature of society, and uh, the strategy for survival. I'd also recommend chapters 12 and 13 in Since Cumorah, and chapters 19, 21, and 22 in the Prophetic Book of Mormon, that's volume eight in the Collected Works. I think that would help you to catch up a little bit with what he's been up to in the, uh, the last 40 years and put, in, uh, put you into tune with a lot of the, uh, the scriptures that he focuses in on, the uh, phraseology, the uh, mentality, and the, the gospel orientations. Yes? Yeah, could you say those resources once more? Well, they're all in the collected works of Hugh Nibley. They're all over in the library or in the bookstore. Uh, volume 6 is the approach to the Book of Mormon. Volume 7 is since Cumorah. Volume 8 is the Prophetic Book of Mormon, Volume uh, 10. Is it 10? Yeah, it is, isn't it? No, it's 9. 9 is, uh, we've, got, we've got about 20 on the drawing boards in one place or another here, so. Uh, volume 9 is the uh, Approaching Zion volume, okay? And it's mostly the lat latter chapters in each of those volumes where he finally gets to telling you what he's, you know, what's really eating at him, what, what is really driving and impelling what he's telling you. Yeah. You can tell us then that we're going to have a final test. You will have a final exam, and uh, Brother Nibley uh, told me to, uh, to instruct you that this, I, I'm a, I know I'm a substitute, and I know what the uh, Utah Teachers Association have told if they go on strike, that uh, nothing that happens when the substitute is present will count for uh, anything. That's not your fortune. Uh, he has asked me to prepare one portion of your final exam, which will cover what we will do here in the next five weeks, uh, five lectures. Okay, so that's what I understand is going on. Question. Okay, the format of this class will be the same as for four twenty-one this semester, one paper, the next semester. Well, uh, I understood that there would be one final exam at the end of the semester. That's correct. And there would be nothing else there. That's what I understand. I've never known Hugh Nibley to teach any other way. Uh, 
I think my final exam for Book of Mormon 121, if I remember the question right, was something like write a book review of the Book of Mormon. That was the question. That was the exam. Okay? So, oh, yes. What was my grade? <laughs> well, I, I got the highest grade in the class, but it wasn't a straight A. <laughs> uh, I think he's gotten lenient in his old age, though, so there's hope. Yes? Pardon? Pardon? No, I will just be here today and then two more weeks. So, Brother Nibley will be back on Friday, March the 9th in time for his 80th birthday, which you should all know a little bit about. I hope you'll... March 9th? No, no, March 27th, 80th birthday. Um, to help Brother Nibley know who has been here and what's been going on, I'm circulating the roll. Please just initial the roll to indicate your attendance uh, here in the next couple. We'll do this every time. I'd also like to point out that there will be a lecture next Tuesday night sponsored by the Foundation for Ancient Research and Mormon Studies. This is Richard Rust, professor of English at the University of North Carolina, who has recently completed a book on the Book of Mormon as literature. He will be uh, delivering the third annual Book of Mormon lecture sponsored by the Foundation there in the Tanner Building. And I encourage all of you to attend, and we'll also allow you to uh, uh, indicate to Brother Nibley if you have attended there so that he will know what you've been up to while he's been away. So I, I think that's uh, enough by way of, uh, of introductions. We've got some important material to cover, so let's, uh, let's get down to work. I'd like to talk primarily about what I call the Sermon at the Temple and spend the next five lectures working on this material. The Sermon at the Temple we all know the Sermon on the Mount by that label. That's Matthew chapters 5 to 7. The Sermon at the Temple is 3rd Nephi chapters 11 to 18. Uh, it is a monumental text. It is one of those texts that acts as a grand central station a switchboard through which almost everything else in the Book of Mormon sooner or later will pass. There are a couple other seminal texts like it. King Benjamin's speech in Mosiah chapters 1 to 6 acts in a similar way as sort of the constitution of the, uh, the covenant that Benjamin uh, placed his people and the Mulekites under, uh, bringing together the Nephite nation and creating the basis for what became 150 years of the Nephite Republic. These documents are important in the life of a civilization. Similarly, the Sermon at the Temple replaced everything else uh, that the Nephites had lived under. In 4th Nephi, uh, they tell us that they had now, from this point forward, lived only according to the commandments which Jesus had given, him, given them while he was there. Uh, there is a radical change in life in Zarahemla and Bountiful and in other cities that the Nephites occupied as a result of this, uh, this Sermon at the Temple. It's a masterful sermon. It is coherent. It is specifically organized. It addresses themes that were of interest and would have been a pressing concern to the people in Bountiful and in the Nephite world in that day. Moreover, it becomes an anchor for everything else in the gospel. Jesus only had a short time to spend with these people at the temple at Bountiful. Uh, he didn't waste a word. What he says is of crucial importance. It's the kind of thing that you and I can look to as an anchor in our life to put our bearings straight, to see what's going on in the world, to see what really matters most in our covenant relationship with our Father in Heaven. I believe, and I wish to su submit for the next five lectures for our testing, the proposition that there is unsurpassed power and strength in the Sermon at the Temple, that it is coherent, insightful, and profound. Notwithstanding the fact that this section of the Book of Mormon has probably been subject to more ridicule and more criticism than any other part of the book. Why? 
because it has the obvious inclusion of Matthew chapters 5 to 7, which to a naive or simple-minded view appear to simply have been spliced in crudely into the middle of a text. Thus you have Mark Twain quipping that the Book of Mormon contains passages which he said were smooched from the New Testament and no credit given. Or you have the Reverend Lamb, who in the 1880s published uh, a lengthy volume uh, criticizing the Book of Mormon. His conclusion, the book is verbose, blundering, and stupid. And he especially viewed this material that I call the Sermon at the Temple as a mere duplication, which you will see it is not, of the Sermon on the Mount, word for word, to quote him, for which he saw no excuse for this lack of originality and constant repetition of the Bible. He says, we have such passages already in the Bible, and God, quote, never does unnecessary things. Why then give us these chapters again? His conclusion, careful, examin careful examination proves it to be an unprincipled plagiarist. I wish to take issue with those conclusions and hope that as we proceed, uh, you will share with me and we'll be able to develop uh, ideas to help us reach a different conclusion. Today I'd like to do two main things. First is to establish a general religious setting for the Sermon at the Temple, and then to establish a more specific religious context for this great discourse. And it's more than a discourse. Uh, we will begin in earnest our look at the material uh, next time, and I would like you to read very carefully your assignment for next week, or next Monday, I guess it will be, will be to read chapters 11 to 14 of 3rd Nephi. I don't care if you read it recently, I want you to read it again. And I'd like you to memorize your choice, certain segments, any segment, any element of the, uh, of this, of those chapters. Okay? Let me, uh, now let me just say, in general, I don't know how much memorizing you do. Some of you are return missionaries, and you know the value of memorization, of studying, and of having things in your mind so that the Spirit can uh, bring to your thoughts those things that uh, you need to be moved to remember. My experience is that if I don't pack a lot of things into my mind and into my heart, uh, there's a vacuum there, and it's pretty hard for the Spirit to move a vacuum. If you give the Spirit a few building blocks to push around at the right time, some very significant things can happen in your life. We don't use our mind for memorizing nearly as much as we ought to. Uh, thinking of Brother Nibley over in Egypt, if, I rem if it's still the case, not long ago anyway, it was a requirement to enter the Muslim universities in Egypt that you have the entire Koran committed to memory. Now that... Uh, uh, that can be done. The human mind is capable of such things. Uh, and yet, uh, we're so lazy, we've got uh, computer disks, we've got uh, uh, books uh, at our disposal, and we feel little need to internalize these materials. You hear stories about the early brethren in the church riding from Kirtland to Missouri. What do you think they did on horseback all the time? Much of it was spent reciting scripture. Uh, they had the whole Bible, well, large portions of it, memorized. So I challenge you to, uh, to do the same. One of the best things I ever did in my life before uh, entering the South German mission, uh, I was a smart aleck kid at the uh, LTM. This is before the MTC days, and they, uh, uh, I had all the discussions memorized, and they said, all right, if you're so smart, why don't you pass off the Sermon on the Mount next week for us in German? And I went off and memorized the whole thing, those three chapters, and passed it off. Never have done anything better in my life. And so, I, you know, it's up to you. You do what you want there, but uh, that's, that's your assignment for next time. Okay, let's go, uh, let's go then, first of all, to our establishing of a general religious setting for the book of 3rd Nephi. What's going on in this world? Well, you know a little bit about the Gadiant and robbers and the problems that uh, were encountered there. First of all, the obvious thing is that these people were living in the imminent expectation of the coming of a Messiah. 
They had prophecies that uh, went back to the days of Lehi, Nephi, Benjamin, uh, and more recently, Samuel the Lamanite, who had specifically talked about the, uh, the coming of Christ. I don't know exactly how, uh, how specific their expectation was. It seems that they, uh, they still were a bit in the dark about exactly what was going to happen. What Jesus would do when he would come and so on were questions that uh, they, they didn't have completely answered. But they knew that he would come that he would fulfill the law, that he would bring about a redemption, and there would be some major changes. Number two, notwithstanding that, they all lived the law of Moses. How do we know that the Nephites lived the law of Moses? Any of you, how, how far back did their living of the law of Moses extend? How do we know that they lived the law of Moses? Jacob, says so. uh, Jacob? when does Jacob say that? Okay, and and they did. They they have a broader understanding. It's a pre-exilic version of the law of Moses, and they also have coupled with that the prophetic traditions, knowing of the coming of Christ. But the the specific passages I'm thinking of. Uh, you're talking about where he said the laws all right, well, there's uh, 2 Nephi 25, where Nephi says, notwithstanding the fact that we know that salvation does not come by the law, we live the law of Moses. Were they strict in their living of the law of Moses? Well, look at some of the passages like 2 Nephi 5, verse 10, when Nephi establishes the monarchy in the city of Nephi. He does all of the things that kings basically do in getting a society going. He builds a temple. You have to have a temple. He uh, establishes the law. He says, we will live the law. And what law is it that he, he says they must live? It's the law of Moses. And he says, we will live it according to its statutes, judgments, ordinances, and so on. The, uh, the nomenclature here becomes important, as we'll see in a minute. He says, we did observe to keep the judgments and the statutes and the commandments of the Lord in all things according to the law of Moses. How long does that continue? Well, in Jerem, if you look at Jerem chapter, Jerem verse 5, he says that they were strict to live the law of Moses. And the law was exceedingly strict. Then look at Alma chapter 30, verse 3, in introducing the materials on Korahor. Again, it says that they were strict to observe the law of Moses, all of its ordinances, laws, and statutes, and so on. Right down to the time of the birth of Christ, what happens in 3rd Nephi chapter 1? Yes? All right, why, why do you think they would have said we don't need to live the law of Moses any longer? All right, they said when Christ comes, then the law will be done away. The sign of his birth had been given. Isn't it logical then to conclude that we are now absolved from the requirements of living the law of Moses? There were people who made that argument. What did they do about that? Toward the end of chapter 1 and 3 Nephi. All right. They, they had to correct this general misunderstanding that uh, the law hadn't yet been fulfilled. Even though Christ had come, the various things that needed to be done and accomplished during his ministry and so on had not yet taken place. It's a logical kind of mistake for them to have made. And, the need for them to have corrected it. If you go back, in fact, and, uh, uh, and look at 2 Nephi chapter 25, when Nephi is talking about Jesus coming to fulfill the law, he's not very specific in when or to what extent. He doesn't say he will fulfill all the law, by the way, which is something that uh, is not taught until uh, 3 Nephi chapter 15. Well, they correct their errors. One of the, uh, one of the things that remains and also may have led to some confusion on their part. Let me just draw some circles here. If you have the concept of covenant, it's interesting that Jesus spells out, he says, the covenant is not fulfilled in me. That's 3 Nephi 15. Within the covenant is the law. The law is a part of the covenant. By the way, in Hebrew and Greek, the word for covenant means 
It's translated our word testament. Now, the, the word testament or covenant describes the entire relationship between God and his people. Now, that, of course, had not been fulfilled completely, and the Nephites could well have argued that uh, there were certain things in the covenant relationship promised by God that had not yet been fulfilled. One of them would have been the fact that the Nephites had not yet been brought back into, the, uh, into Israel. There were still these promises, unfulfilled and outstanding. Well, that certainly can't have been fulfilled yet because the Nephites are still living over in uh, Bountiful and Zarahemla, expecting that they they will someday be brought back together with these others. Now, the law is a part of this covenant relationship. Uh, you can fulfill the law, and as Jesus says, not yet still fulfill all of the covenants and all of the promises that have been made to all of Israel. Interestingly, within the law, there are also subdivisions. Uh, the law, Hebrew is your, your word Torah, our English word law does not begin to capture the meaning of the word Torah. Torah means more teaching. The Torah is identified with the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And you know there's a lot in uh, Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy that we wouldn't consider law. I'm a law professor, but I, I look at some of those stories and I say, this, this isn't statutory legislation. This isn't what I would call positive law. But to the ancient Jews, the Torah embraced all of those teachings in a broader sense. Did Jesus come to fulfill the Torah? Well, not in a very specific sense. Now, within the law, you have things like the commandments. We already read that uh, pleonastic list that Nephi gives you. We did keep the statutes and ordinances and commandments. You see you have statutes. These are all different Hebrew words. Statutes and judgments, these are the mishpatim. And the ordinances or the performances, these are the hukah or the hok, hokot, okay, hukah, and so on. But if you go to something like 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 3, when the kingdom is passed on from uh, David to his son Solomon, he exhorts Solomon to keep the statutes, the hukot, the commandments, the mitzvot, the judgments, the mishpatim, the testimonies, these are the edut, uh, and so on, for all, and keep all that is written in the Torah, the law of Moses. Now, the question again becomes, when Jesus comes to fulfill the law, which of these does he fulfill? It's interesting to me that when you go to 4th Nephi, and uh, here we're looking at verse uh, 8, I believe it is, that they say, we no longer observe the ordinances and the outward performances, which may be identified with this portion of the law, but they do say, but we do keep the commandments, especially the commandments as they have now been explained and fulfilled by Christ. Well, I present that, uh, and by the way, the Book of Mormon is very interesting, interestingly consistent in its use of this legal terminology. I, I give you this to, to give you a perspective on what it might possibly have meant to these people to talk about living the law of Moses. <coughs> to them, the law of Moses is not what we think of when we usually think of just, uh, say, the law of sacrifice at the temple. The law of Moses was a very broad concept. It embraced their entire constitutional law, public law, their civil law, their private law on commercial transactions. It told you what happened when somebody's ox wandered into someone else's field and trampled on the corn. Uh, it uh, prescribed things like uh, trampling or uh, oppressing the orphan and the wicked, or the, the orphans and the widows. It, uh, you know, a lot of things were covered uh, in, the, uh, in the law of Moses. Well, the Nephites lived the law of Moses. And... Uh, I'd like to give you just a couple examples to uh, show you right here out of 3rd Nephi uh, what we mean. I've passed out to you a little handout about the execution of Zemnarihah. Let me take a minute to, uh, let's see, and I don't think I kept a copy of that. Is there an extra? Uh, thanks. 
We have actually in the Book of Mormon quite a lot of legal material when you stop and think about it. There's the trial of Sherem, the trial of Abinadi, the trial of Korahor, the trial of Nahor, uh, the uh, trial and detection and execution of Seantum and other people like that. All of these uh, legal proceedings are transacted in accordance with the uh, ancient Israelite jurisprudence and according to principles in the law of Moses. One of those principles was that a person couldn't be executed except in certain prescribed ways. Uh, the punishments had to be meted out very carefully. Uh, you had to be sure that the crime matched the nature of the punishment and so the laws usually explained when a punishment should be uh, exacted in the form of stoning or execution by the sword, for example, for an apostate city uh, and so on. Jewish law, as it develops later, becomes uh, much more specific and rigid about the designation of modes of execution and punishment. One of those modes of punishment pertained in Deuteronomy 22 to the displaying of the executed corpse after a body had been stoned. Deuteronomy says that it was important that after the body was killed, that the body would be hung on a tree it's not until the Talmud and the medieval writers that we learn something about why they probably did this in ancient Israel. The main reason was so that people would walk by and, uh, and this would be notoriously heralded so that everyone would see the kind of thing that happens to a person who has been so infamous as to deserve this kind of punishment. Now, not contained in the, in the Bible but found in the Talmudic literature is then a little more explanation of how they would uh, go about doing this and what they would do at the end of the day. For example, just with the, as with the crucifixion of Christ, it was not permissible to leave the body hanging overnight. Uh, the body, after all, is created in the image of God and therefore it would be an offense to God to mutilate or desecrate the body. Uh, the Talmud and Maimonides explain that it's important as you take the body down off the tree to chop the tree down. Why? They want to completely eradicate from the face of the earth all memory that this person had ever lived. I mean, he is so wicked. In hanging him up on the tree, you're hanging him between heaven and earth, as Brother Nibley's pointed out. Neither will receive this wicked person. And then when you chop down the tree, uh, you don't, again, want people ever walking by even saying, that's the tree that good old so-and-so was hung on. Well, there are only two places that I know of in world legal literature that talk about the need to chop a tree down after you've hung a person on it. One is in the Jewish literature that I've just talked about, and the other is in 3 Nephi chapter 4, verses 28 to 33, with the execution of the notorious leader of the Gadianton robbers, Zemnariha. They take him, they hang him on the top of the tree, and when he's dead, they chop the tree down, and they all stand around and in a ceremonious way chant, may God cause to be felled to the earth all people who try to bring down our civilization, our country, bring down righteousness, just as we are chopping down this person and this tree. The whole thing becomes a symbolic uh, felling. And uh, that's a, an interesting little detail. Interesting for a lot of reasons, but the relevant one for this lecture is to show the extent to which aspects of the law of Moses and of the uh, ancient traditions and legal requirements were being observed by the Nephites clear into this period. And we could talk about a number of others like that, but let that suffice as, a, as an example. Let me, uh, let me then suggest that if you were a Nephite and you were, uh, you know, standing around in Bountiful after the signs of Jesus' death had been given, that it would still be a bit of a question in your mind what we should do next. You know that the law of Moses is now in some way superseded. It's kind of like being in Romania today. You, you don't have a government, you don't have a law. What do we do? Do we go about reconstructing the law ourselves? Do we look to the prophet to give us the law? Do we wait for Christ himself to come? But this would have been a question that they wouldn't have had a, an immediate answer to. They knew that something incredibly important had happened, 
The destructions made that perfectly obvious. They knew that something was no longer applicable. But the voice from heaven in 3 Nephi chapter 9 hadn't really clarified this issue very much either. For example, uh, in chapter 9, verse 17, the voice simply says, In me is the law fulfilled. All right, we know that. But what comes next? Chapter 9, verse 20, the voice from heaven says, I no longer want sacrifice by the shedding of blood. The Nephites would have then known that that aspect of the law of Moses was done away. But what is to take its place? The phrase that is used is simply, what I now want is the sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. That phrase, by the way, comes right out of Psalms 51, verse 17. And as such, was always thought in pious Judaism as the necessary precondition for making a valid sacrifice of any kind. Did that mean to the Nephites that they were simply to uh, go on as things had been? In other words, the broken heart and contrite spirit was still a part of what they were to do, only they weren't to offer sacrifice of blood. Okay, well, questions then. That's, I think, among many factors, a, a general religious setting for why the people might have gathered around the temple and have been discussing in chapter 11, verse 1, with great amazement, the mighty changes that had taken place, and I think those were not just physical changes, but the mighty changes in their society. Many people were dead. Mighty changes in their legal and religious system as well. And they were amazed, and they stood and wondered. And I think as they pondered on those questions, uh, then the manifestation of the resurrected Christ is precipitated and occurs. I don't think that just came out of the blue. I know of no revelations in, very few I guess, I haven't stopped to think about this, but very few come without someone asking a question. Have you asked? Nephi pushes his brothers Laman and Lemuel. Joseph Smith received so many of the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants as a result of asking specific questions about the meaning of things. I imagine that as the Nephites stood around the temple at Bountiful, they too were asking questions. What next? Well, why? Why were they at the temple at Bountiful? Let's now turn our attention to a more specific religious context for the sermon at the temple. One of the requirements for the law of Moses, and you'll find this uh, in Exodus 23, you'll find it throughout the book of Leviticus, toward the end of the book of Deuteronomy, one of the requirements was that three times every year, all men, and for the Feast of Tabernacles, all men, women, and children, I suppose women and children came for a number of them, we don't know exactly, but we do know for sure that all of the families had to be present for the celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles when they sat in tents or booths around the temple while the king delivered a speech, reminiscent, of course, of, of uh, King Benjamin's speech in Mosiah 1 to 6. Three times a year, all Israel had to present itself before God at the temple. What for? Primarily for covenant renewal. When Joshua says in Joshua 24, Choose ye this day whom ye will serve. This isn't the first time Israel has chosen to follow Jehovah. This is a covenant renewal, very much like you renew your covenants of baptism every Sunday when you partake of the sacrament. At the temple they read the statutes, they read the law, they were instructed by the priests, they performed certain rituals and ordinances. They had a liturgy that they followed very specifically on each of these high holy festival days. These feasts, uh, the three that, they, uh, that were convocations festivals were Passover, Pentecost, and the year rite festivals which brought together in the ancient world all of the elements of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Feast of Tabernacles, and Rosh Hashanah, the New Year, which appears to have been a single ritual complex in the pre-exilic period. But you have those three main festivals. Well, the, uh, the logical conclusion is that uh, if they are living the law of Moses uh, and still 
strictly doing so, that the observance of the festival requirements would not yet have been abrogated. And therefore, it would have been logical for all of this Nephite city to have presented itself before the Lord at their temple, all the men, women, and children, and notice that they're there. That, in my mind, rules out the possibility that this is some kind of a city council pulled together to deal with the emergency at hand. You'd only have the men, the elders, attending such a, uh, an affair as that. But the men, women, and children are there. They're there from the first thing in the morning. They don't have to run off and get everybody. That's the next day when Jesus says, go get the people in the neighboring villages or wherever. But the multitude is there. They are waiting, I think, to say, as they logically would have, all right, we are now here for our festival, but what do we do? We, don't, we know we're not supposed to offer sacrifice, but what next? Okay, question. Um, if, this, if they were meeting the temple for that town, does that mean the other towns would have their own temple? And if so, why do Christ keep the temple? Well, uh, it, it's possible that they had other temples, but not likely. It seems in the Nephite history that there was always one main temple. Now, the, the center of population moved. You had the temple at Nephi, and, but when they leave, they go to, the, to Zarahemla and they build a new temple there. There are some people who are reactionary enough not to accept the new temple in Zarahemla. And that, of course, is the Zenith colony that says, we want to go back and at any cost redeem the land because that's got the real temple in it. Now, why are they up in Bountiful? Well, it's because uh, in the, the face of the Gadianton War, uh, there was that seven-year period when they had to gather all of their property together in one place where they were a little closer to the narrow neck, which they could defend, and they then moved their population center. I would think that this is the main temple uh, of the Nephites. If it's then one of the major feasts, why wouldn't the rest of the land come uh, Well, uh, it may have been that... Uh, Oh, it's a good question. Uh, the question is, why wouldn't everybody have already been there? Uh, and I guess there are some possible answers we could speculate about that. One is that maybe it's not a feast that they're gathering for. I can't say for sure that it is. It seems to me likely that it is. Uh, another reason might be that they were gathering for the first day of something and other people were on their way uh, from a distance. That's a possibility. I don't know. I mean, you can speculate. Maybe they just, uh, things were chaotic. Maybe uh, they, uh, they didn't know what to do, and so a lot of people had stayed home, and it was only the very diligent who had gone to the temple to try to find out what to do next. Uh, you're welcome with me, I guess, to wonder why that was the case. I yes? I guess I've read a number of different things about this. Elder Talbot said it was during the, I guess, 40-day period that Christ ministered among people. Jerusalem. Yes. Church seat, yes, man, says 40 days after, is after the ascension and everything. Yeah, the timing is an interesting question, and we simply don't have an answer to the question of how long after Jesus' resurrection did this occurred. The problem is you've got conflicting statements right within 3 Nephi, the last couple verses in 3 Nephi 10. Uh, and the question is, how do you read the phrase in the ending of the 30 and 4th year? If that phrase describes the time when Christ appeared, then it was a year-end festival of some kind. Uh, on the other hand, if that simply is some kind of an editorial marker that says, I am now going to tell you what happened in the 30 and 4th year, then we have no idea when it occurred. You have also the reference that says something like, soon after his ascension into heaven, and uh, it doesn't say which ascension. Is it the first ascension? Uh, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended on the morning of resurrection. Is it the ascension on the day of Pentecost uh, in Acts, or just before the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 1? We don't know. So that becomes, a, again, an interesting question, a puzzle, but uh, we're not quite sure. I think we can get a feel, though, for the type of general uh, uh, religious uh, type of meeting this would have been, although not specifically which festival. I have my own preference. I think it was uh, uh, a meeting on the day of Pentecost. Uh, the reason is that uh, in ancient Israel, the day on which the giving of the law on Mount Sinai was celebrated was the Feast of Shavuot, or the Feast of Pentecost. And that was the day that God came down on Mount Sinai to give the law. And uh, I guess the poetic 
beauty and symmetry of having God come down to give the new law on a similar day is uh, almost irresistible to me, but uh, it could have been any others as well. Well, question? Uh, I just wanted to digress for a second. You, uh, when you gave this example of the uh, aspects of the Jewish law uh, concerning the uh, covenant and you know, how they, they cut down the trees yes. as, as a significant uh, link between the Book of Mormon and the Jewish law, you said there were several others. Would you mind briefly? Uh, just, just oh, well, yeah, I would mind. Uh, question is, uh, uh, could I digress and give you a lecture on other aspects of Nephite law that are similar to uh, ancient Israelite law? I'll, I'll give you one right off the bat. Uh, uh, to take, for example, the exemption from military duty that is given to the Ammonites. Uh, this is an extraordinary thing. In the ancient world, every able-bodied man had to bear arms. You go back to the book of Mosiah, and remember the desperate wars that that little colony in the city of Nephi fought against the Lamanites and how these old kings armed all the men, even down to the young men. And then you have this pocket of Ammonites who have sworn an oath that they won't go again to war. And, and they're given a military exemption. Why? Well, if you go to the book of Deuteronomy, you'll find that there are four classifications of people who were entitled to a military exemption. One of them is the group of people who are faint-hearted or fearful. Now, you say to yourself, wait a minute, every soldier is faint-hearted or fearful in the face of battle. Uh, wouldn't that therefore exempt everyone? And if you're a good conscientious objector, you know, that would be the place you'd go to, uh, you know, to raise that objection. Uh, the explanations given in the Talmud is that this doesn't mean anybody who's afraid of anything, but only the people who fear that if they should die in battle, they would uh, not be well, things would not be well with them with God. They fear because of their sins. They fear because of transgressions. You don't want a person standing next to you in the ranks who is afraid that if he dies in the battle, his soul will be lost. We can stand mortal fear, but you can't stand divine fear. Now that's exactly the problem that the Ammonites were in. Anyway, there are a lot of other nuances in that particular uh, discussion, and, uh, and it's that sort of thing that you'll find all over. Well, let's carry on then with some specifics. One, one of the specifics of uh, the religious context of the Sermon at the Temple may then well be that it was a part of some kind of, of religious observance or a, uh, one of the regular uh, festivals that these people would have been observing. Number two, a very important clue is given to us, and that is that this sermon is given at the temple. Jesus could have picked a lot of places to appear, as one of you have suggested. He could have appeared at the town gate. He could have appeared out on a mountain. He could have appeared uh, uh, in a synagogue. But no, he chooses to appear at the temple. Uh, this is a profound temple-related text. Uh, we will see next lecture that if we are sensitive to temple connections, that the coherence and meaning of the Sermon on the Mount all of a sudden snaps into sharp focus. Some New Testament scholars, by the way, have toyed with the idea, uh, W.D. Davies in particular, that when the New Testament refers to the Sermon on the Mount, no normal mountain is meant. In ancient Israel, there was one mount, and that, of course, was the Temple Mount. Let us go up unto the mountain of the Lord, refers to the temple in Jerusalem. And thus, some New Testament scholars who have sought Jewish backgrounds for the Sermon on the Mount have toyed with the idea that what Jesus is delivering is a new temple-related sermon in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we will see, and the Book of Mormon corroborates this, that those scholars are on to far more than they suspect. Number three, in the way of just contextual background information. By the way, let me digress, digress for just a minute to remind you how important it is in interpreting or understanding any written work to think something about the context in which the work arose. If you know something about the audience 
to whom a speech is addressed. You know a great deal interpretively about why things are being said, what they mean. Exactly the same words given to different audiences can take on different meanings. So knowing something about the context, the whys, and what Jesus is expecting. Who is the audience that he's addressing, say, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew? We know very little about what that was to mean, how it was to be used, and you can read literally hundreds of biblical journal articles speculating about the context and the Zitzimleben and the audience response and the reader response analysis of uh, trying to unpack what's going on in the Sermon on the Mount. The Book of Mormon does not leave us with that kind of a problem. It gives us contextualizing information. One of them, as I've said, is this temple point. The second, we're now on point three, I guess, if you're numbering them, festival temple. Point three is this speech is clearly delivered in the context of covenant making. What actually happens as a result of what Jesus gives in the Sermon at the Temple. It all leads to 3 Nephi chapter 18, where the people enter into a personal covenant where they promise that they will keep the commandments which He has given us this day. Where are those commandments found? In the Sermon at the Temple. This is clearly a covenant-making text. Thus, for example, in 3 Nephi 11, we'll see that Jesus invites these people to become the children of their Father in Heaven. That's covenant language. How was it that the people of Benjamin became the children of God, spiritually begotten this day? In Mosiah 5, it was by entering into a covenant uh, with God and with the King. Point number four in terms of contextual interpretation is very clear that on multiple occasions in this text, Jesus refers to his words as commandments. We will see that biblical scholars have struggled to try to understand what Jesus really meant in the Sermon on the Mount. Are these abstract ethical principles that are impossible for any human being to really live in this life? Or did he really mean for people to try to live these laws? And who did he want to live these laws? Is he talking to all human beings? Or is he only talking to a certain group of converted, committed people? Is he talking about rules and principles that are to apply in this world, in this day, here and now? Or is he only talking about rules that will only be effectuated in the messianic age, in the millennium, or in the age to come? These are questions that the rest of the world stands boggled over. Martin Luther, for example, when he ran into the Sermon on the Mount, found that it was so inconsistent with his own views about salvation by grace. After all, it demands that people do things and indeed do more than just say, Lord, Lord. Luther couldn't uh, reconcile that with the rest of his theology and ended up calling the Sermon on the Mount ein Meisterstuch des Teufels a masterpiece of the devil. Why? Because it had twisted what he thought was the real message of Jesus around to something completely different. Just give you that to indicate how, how difficult it is for people who don't have something like the Book of Mormon to even understand what kind of statements Jesus is making here. The Book of Mormon clearly tells us that he is giving commandments. There are some other contextualizing points uh, very quickly. We know that this is a part of the 40-day literature. We know that certain esoteric and secret and important things happened to the disciples of Jesus in Jerusalem as a part of the 40-day ministry. It was here, we believe, that they received an endowment. Luke 24 talks about them being told to stay in Jerusalem until they are endowed with power from on high. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and others commented that Jesus himself gave the disciples during this period basically the equivalent of our temple endowment. The purpose of the sermon at the temple is clearly stated in 3 Nephi 15 verse 1, and that is that it is of eschatological importance. If a disciple wishes to be lifted up at the last day and withstand the final day of judgment, 
he must hear and do and remember these things that Jesus has instructed them this day. If they do, they will survive and pass into the presence of God at the final day of judgment. That again is an important clue about what Jesus is talking about, which we'll carry on with on Monday. So, take a real good look with these ideas in mind uh, back at the uh, materials in chapters 11 to 14 in particular. Okay?